was also interested to know that you uh, headed the art department at the Buckingham Brown and Nichols. I didn't know that. Well, that was but, before I retired. Before you <laughs> I'm free now, so. Yeah, but that, that's really fascinating to know, yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, she certainly was what you might call a fine art photographer. And we are now going to be delighted to see her marvelous aesthetic eye, which zeroes in on some beautiful things, and then share with us these uh, three remarkable photographers. So, uh, Parrish, you want to begin? I'm certainly. So I, I believe Mark is going to mute you all, which is just the way it's going to be. But let me go to my own screen share. Hold on, we'll get there. Okay, so. I'm hoping you now have full screen look at my slides, okay? I'm a little bit of a newbie of doing a webinar to everybody. But anyway, I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the Alliance for asking me to do this and also for all the other programs you all have been putting together. I just think it's been so terrific to have these um, moments of um, listening to other voices about completely non-political things. So um, thank you, Pat Hawkins, Doris, Miriam Baker. Thank you, Mark, uh, for being the tech person this morning. OK, so basically, I want to say that I am going to be not giving an art historical um, lecture so much as just sharing with you three photographers whose work I think are, are extraordinarily interesting, complex, and in many ways relevant to our current political uh, moment, even though um, most of the work I'm gonna show you is from the 40s, sorry, the 40, late 40s, primarily the 50s and into the 60s. So um, I wanna say that there are gonna be maybe questions you have along the way, but you're muted. So either write them down on a piece of paper or there is a chat room and Mark will keep track of some of that. If there's something that needs immediate attention, put it in the chat room and Mark can get to me, okay? I think that's good. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you background about these people. I'm going to give you enough images that you can really start to see what that each artist individual um, vision is and, and the direction and the power of their work. I don't like Zoom teaching at all. <laughs> I like to be in a room with people and see the responses and get the questions real time, but we'll just go with this. So um, let's start with Robert Frank. And again, I'm looking at a diverse audience, you guys. Um, I sense that there's probably at least half of you who've heard of him, and there may be half of you that have never heard of Robert Frank. So I'm going to assume you don't know who he is. Um, extraordinarily important um, American photographer and filmmaker, uh, born in 1924, lived a long life. Um, interesting thing about him, I just want to give you a little background before I show you some images is that um, he was Swiss born. He came to America in the uh, late 40s and um, was a passionate artist, but of like all artists needed to find a way to have an income. So he worked as a fashion photographer, um, but he came to America already with some small handmade books of photographs that he'd made just of his own work. Um, he had the opportunity to meet somebody named Edward Steichen, again, in the history of photography, phenomenally influential, important person who was really one of the earliest advocates for seeing photography as an art form, not just as a mechanical reproduction of things. Anyway, um, Steichen recognized uh, Frank's craft and vision right away and included some of his photographs in a very early photo show, art, photo art show um, in 1950. Um, 
Frank really was happy to be in America, loved the, ex the freedom, the lots of things about America, but he also saw that it was a, a country of contradictions. Um, a bit, this is fast forwarding because there's a lot of work that he was doing before he was given the recognition in 1955 to have received a Guggenheim, which allowed him to follow through on a project which sounds just extraordinarily <laughs> ambitious. He wanted to photograph America, okay. Uh, he took a two year road trip with sometimes with his wife and children in the car and went crisscrossing across America to try to really move himself into communities, different parts of the country, to try to grasp what America is. I mean, can you imagine this ambition really staggering? Um, at every place he wound up seeing um, both the, the gifts of American culture and, and some problems. Um, and uh, his camera work um, was quite new and I'm gonna be talking about it in a, in a bit. Um, he, America it had never quite seen itself the way Robert Frank saw it meaning he saw a sense of alienation, a sense of many people feeling lost, not all, of course, divided, not all, of course, but fast moving, vast. Um, he saw the political system that's perhaps too self-satisfied and cronies happening and uh, wealth, love of consumerism, you know, in, inescapable aspects of, um, of, of what we all know is part of any culture. Um, but he uh, was able to kind of slip into communities and with his camera to, to bring forth uh, images that conveyed some of these complex issues. Um, his style of work, uh, some people hated. It was grainy, soft focus, tilted views, low light, sometimes shooting from the hip. He used a camera called a Leica, which was um, small-ish and uh, roll film, and that allowed him a lot of um, mobility, moving in and out of uh, situations, never with a flash, uh, always with available light. The images that I'm gonna show you are exclusively from this book, and um, it became, uh, when it was published in 1959, it really changed the nature of photography, what, what could be said with a photograph and how people could say it. Um, and certainly I think there's not a, a photo historian who wouldn't say that it's really one of the most influential photography books of the 20th century. Um, let's see, w one thing I'm not, doing in the slide presentation is to talk or to show you how carefully Robert Frank set up this book, meaning uh, he took 27,000 photographs in two years and called it down to 83. And um, he was uh, extraordinarily um, careful in how it was laid out, the sequence of the photographs. I'm not showing you the sequence, which is in a sense a, a sin, but, uh, but rather picking out what I see as, as kind of themes. Um, it's interesting when I talk about how he was so interested in the sequence of that book. You know, what, what image would talk to what image? How would it unfold before you as the viewer as you went through the pages? He was even so attached to that, that when he gave the complete collection of the Americans, all 87 prints to the Addison Gallery in Andover, he specified that it could only be displayed in the order and the arrangement that he agreed upon. So um, I'm just pointing that out because um, he became a filmmaker later in life and you can see how his attachment to sequencing would lead directly to filmmaking. In any case, what he saw as he began to go around the country, 
is America's vastness. Just so much space. He saw the politics, he attended gatherings, he went to political rallies. His, he always seemed to be in the right place at the right time for these images, which I find dumbfounding. He had a um, real fascination you'll see in if you, if you ever do get this book from the library or you own it with uh, American diners as, as a subject. And um, I love this one particularly because of, you know, maybe perhaps a, a, a very obvious contrast between the Santa and this very solemn face of the waitress. But like the other photographers who he was influenced by, uh, Walker Evans and so on, he's fascinated by and lets his camera um, include all the details you need and nothing you don't need to get a, a, a beautifully complex image. Um, he looked at working class neighborhoods. He went to what we call, I guess, high class events. This is a charitable ball. Again, what I was saying about every detail that's needed is here. Like, where are we? We have, we have this, some kind of a, a brochure here. We have this moment of this kiss. We have this uh, face or gesture that seems to say to me anyway, of course you should be kissing me. Um, uh, the, the tender, this hand, the, the jewelry, the lighting, um, it's, uh, it's quick, it's grainy, um, it's very telling. As he traveled, what he saw were the realities of race and class differences across America. His images are not consistent with the rosy optimism of po post-war middle-class America, but rather, uh, I'm sorry to read this, I don't usually do that, but anyway, a rather a trenchant look at loneliness, and the various ways American greatness was being mythologized. There's humor, there's unexpected warmth, and there's always his extraordinary and original camera work. I love this one, for example. Look at how, if, if those of you who use your cameras, as when I was teaching students, I would always use this slide to talk about the edges the edges of your frame. What, what are you getting in and are you completing the detail um, needed to establish all the importance of this moment? What um, I said he was uh, in, in the Americans quite fascinated by diners, but he was also fascinated by the jukebox. This is mid fifties jukeboxes had suddenly landed in so many locations and became these kind of altars or gatherings or like some strange UFO that people hung out to kind of get the latest. And I, this particular image with this young boy uh, imitating whatever he's listening to, he too is blowing the horn. Um, and the jukebox sits there like a great kind of, I don't know what, <laughs> something to be venerated. And the jukebox turns up in, and he found jukeboxes in many locations always with this kind of strange, like it's arrived from somewhere else feeling to the images. One thing that is inescapable in the Americans is Robert's um, exploration of race in America. This image is uh, stunning, I think, and it's, wow, I've got construction noise outside. Is that, is that annoying? Shall I close the window? Oh, well, I'll keep going. Um, the contrast of a, a, a very bald, very white baby with the nanny nurse uh, that he, uh, he chatted with this woman. He, she agreed to be photographed. Um, the whole way he's got her po posed or found her just on the side of the street. You can feel uh, Robert Frank's ability to get close to his image, to his subjects and to find that moment that seems to be something you really have to slow down and think about. Who are, who, who takes care of children? Who, uh, I mean, we are seeing this so much right now in our current political time. Um, who are the, 
frontline workers. Um, so there, I, I love the space, the kind of ambiguous, out of focus space actually adds to the way this figure is isolated. He attended an African-American funeral. He went places with his camera that people just weren't going. A.D. Coleman, who was a very, very famous uh, critic of photography, said that this collection of photograph uh, photographs is a ticking time bomb, which has yet to be diffused. Interesting phrase about, um, about Robert Frank's photographs. What they revealed is a ticking time bomb. And I bet all of us can relate to that phrase, and, um, certainly this past summer and so on. Um, I hope we can come back to this image. It is stunningly complex and uh, in fact, kind of in one image, a picture of our society. I'm um, hoping at the end of our time, if we, if we, we have time, we can um, open up talk and look at some of these more closely, but just to, point out we have a, a kind of not quite visible white Caucasian man, Caucasian woman, children, African-American man, African-American woman. We read things left to right. It itself becomes almost a picture of American society in terms of hierarchies combined and this always just intrigues me so much is these abstract, barely visible mm, suggestions of other pictures that we might or might not know uh, in the, in the uh, windows above. So in his um, series, he often comes back to public places that have flags. It's not the flag itself, but what, what is being depicted in, the, um, in these town halls and these post offices, how, how is what is America being depicted? And something about the eeriness of this billowing flag next to Abe in Washington, I think is quite remarkable. Christ died for our sins. Christ came to save sinners. Land of Lincoln, Illinois, 1956. Several junctures along the way, he went into television land or he photographed uh, how televisions were beginning to come into homes. I like this one very much in a, in a early television studio with the sense of the new made for TV face and the self-reflecting between the subject and how it's coming out on the screen, a kind of beginning to be sealed world of uh, television. Uh, I'd love to hear what you all think of this image. <laughs> uh, the great march of, of youth in one direction and this man sitting on a bench watching it go by facing the other way with his newspaper with no doubt as we experience in um, newspapers when we pick them up all of the complex and unsolvable issues so the sense of promise and then reality and uh, whatever you want to make of this gesture it's a stunning photograph too, that the man is wearing a white hat against those black robes. I mean, it just works compositionally so, so, so well. This is one thing that uh, Frank must have believed very deeply. He quoted it, uh, he wrote this in, in a book for his wife, Mary, from Antoine Santing Supere, who wrote The Little Prince. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So that's such an interesting thing for a photographer to say who is working with a visual medium. 
And my feeling of wanting to hold this up for you is that he's really someone who is pushing the medium all the time to try to get at the more invisible truths uh, that are before us. He said, and at another point, above all I know that the life for a photographer cannot be a matter of indifference. Uh, Robert Frank, some people found him kind of grumpy, but you know, I feel his photographs have such uh, compassion really and the way he would pick out, for example, this elevator operator, low light, it's blurry, people are moving by her and uh, to, to most people she's anonymous, but with that face um, that we see that I think is, is quite poignant, um, frozen in the, in the rush of life. In the Americans, there are many photographs with cars. And he was asked about that once. Why do you have so many cars and so many of your photographs? And he said, just look around. Um, he saw in the 50s, this, the advent of the complete love affair with the car and the speeding up of life. I love this photograph with, shall we say, senior citizens seated on a bench um, and the fancy, fancy car of the time whizzing by. Cars, all people, all classes of people and cars, all, all cultures, love affair of the car. Three children at night waiting, I presume for their parents to come out from somewhere but look at the light in this one. Isn't it amazing? It is lit by the interior light of the car as one of the children decides to slide right up to be at the driver's wheel, kind of aspiring, shall we say, to when he becomes the driver of the car. Some of his photographs uh, included works from the Ford Motor company's factory. Um, this is the uh, assemb assembly line here of putting together these cars that he saw everywhere. When people look at my pictures, he said, I want them to feel the way they do when they want to read a line of a poem twice. Okay, that's really interesting as a way to slow down for us and to think about what's before you as not just, okay, move on, but as something, at least this is his hope that we would slow down, look, think. Um, I often say to friends of mine who are writers, you know, if they're in writer's blocks, we'll pick up a book of photos like this and, and, and use the photographs as keys to writing poems because these are very rich in so many ways. the improbable finding of a cowboy on the streets of New York. It was apparently during a rodeo that had come to town. But uh, again, I'm struck by the unobtrusiveness that, that uh, this cowboy seems unaware of the camera. Um, and so kind of both comfortable and out of place at the same time. Moving America moving fast, crowds. What is America? All of these things are what Robert Frank brings before you in that book. And I, I really recommend it. Um, as I say, find it in a library. You'll enjoy your time with it. This is what Jack Kerouac says in the introduction. The humor, the sadness, the everythingness and the Americanness of these pictures. He, Robert Frank, Robert Frank sucked a sad poem right out of America onto film, taking rank among the tragic poets of the world. As I said early on, some people hated this book and it wasn't immediately loved by any means, but uh, it became, and still is, it was republished many, many times. Um, 
<clears throat> most influential book of this sort. Okay, shall we switch gears? How are we doing out there? See, I can't tell. Thumbs up, I see a few of you. Time, oh my God, I got to speed up. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is gonna have a different tone and um, I think you'll find it quite delightful. If I had just done Robert Frank, you might be both uh, in a poetic mode, but a little bit of a sad mode, but I feel Helen Levitt has another important truth to tell us and it'll take us to a different mood. She too was a filmmaker as well as a photographer. She loved New York. She grew up and I'll tell you some bio in a minute. Uh, she roamed the streets of certain neighborhoods. Isn't, isn't this delightful? The gestures and the uh, spontaneity, this girl finding the way to dance and the boy imitating her. The drama of what's going on in windows, we don't really know, but look at, at how this uh, photograph is so beautifully framed, the frame within the frame, uh, multiple frames, uh, and the, all of these uh, people looking in different directions. Drama, invention, What's in your bag? What's going on? Where's he looking? What am I gonna build? Look at the marks on the walls. She has a, uh, a gift, I believe, for, for finding authentic inner life of children, particularly. and some of the delight, uh, witty, tender moments, um, exuberance, vitality, whatever words you wanna give to these street scenes. You can see in her work, great sympathy, um, responsiveness to the human community, and especially as I keep saying, the lives of children. She was born in Brooklyn, Italian Jewish family. She was very early drawn to art, wanted to be herself uh, either a painter or a drawer, but then she fell in love with photography uh, in high school and dropped out and began working as a portrait photographer. She met, uh, which is amazing, um, and I wonder, I'm sure some of you, I can't see your nods, but some of you must know Henri Cartier-Bresson, who is a extremely famous, well-known French photographer who was in New York. And um, she and uh, Henri actually photographed together um, when, when she was very young, meaning she was only about 20 years old when she had the opportunity to follow or kind of be with uh, Cartier-Bresson as they photographed in New York. Um, she described that as extraordinarily influential to, to watch his, his style and his approach. Um, just an overview. She, a little bit later, got a job as a, uh, to work for the federal project to help teach children art um, in Harlem, um, Lower East Side, Bronx. She, along the way, became friends with uh, Walker Evans, James Agee. She began making uh, and printing her own black and white photographs. She too used a Leica camera, uh, has a great lens, it's portable, it, um, it's quick. And um, she had some photographs from very early on in 1940. I wanted to say earlier that I believe um, Helen Levitt is, is uh, in some ways, you know, an extremely well celebrated photographer, but much less known than say Robert Frank. And uh, her work is every bit as good. Um, some people call her the photographer's photographer, which I think is a kind of snotty phrase. All you have to do is look at these photographs and you'll see things to love in them. Um, she uh, did herself also get a Guggenheim, two Guggenheim fellowships that kept her work going and eventually was hired at Pratt. Um, as a photography teacher and instructor. 
when I was teaching photography, my students, this was their all time favorite photograph of Helen Levitz. And, um, <laughs> you know, what, what's going on? Oh, he lost the pacifier or she dropped her wallet in the bottom of the carriage. We, we don't know, but Helen was on the streets and found this um, scene and, and responded. And I think, I think it's hysterical and, 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 and lovely. There's also a visual, great visual um, humor to her. Um, in this case, just to, to spot the checks of the, of the car, the checks of this woman's uh, outfit and her hat and the checks in her bag and the, you know, the, the uh, rectangles that are throughout this composition. It's both funny, it's visually complex. Her images have a lot of wonder in them and uh, with the children, either one of them set those bubbles going or those bubbles were just loose on the street. But in any case, it's this uh, pausing quiet moment. And this one too, two boys consoling each other. I wanna say how how sweet this is. Also, again, how unaware they are of the photographer, which says volumes, meaning um, anybody who's tried street photography, it is not easy to have people ignore you so that you can quietly um, find these, these small poems happening around you. This is something that Helen Levitt said about, about her work. <clears throat> In the streets of the poor quarter of great cities are above all a theater and a battleground. There unaware and unnoticed, every human being is a poet, a masker, a warrior, a dancer. And in his or her innocent artistry, she projects against the turmoil of the street an image of human existence. Now here is a very lovely, one of my all time favorite uh, images. And maybe again, if we have time, we could come back to it and talk about it more deeply. Three masked children, but right away, just look at how the theatricality of it They've come from the backstage. They've come on to the public stage of the front stoop. They're ready to emerge. By contrast, these boys are very aware of the camera and performing for it and energized by it. Look at this doorway, which itself is kind of a proscenium but now the children are scrambling all over it. You know, you would not see this anytime today <laughs> because everything is, children don't play like this in the streets, I just wanted to say. And um, that's, you know, maybe good news, maybe bad news. Um, I've had photo students who loved this work of Helen Levitt. And when we were doing kind of mentor projects and they tried to, photograph in her style. They always said, gosh, there's no, but there are no children on the streets anywhere in Boston. And even Helen Levitt uh, said, probably a product of a couple of things towards the end of the sixties and into the seventies, television, more life indoors and air conditioning and less of a sense that the streets were just a spill out of your, of your home, which is clearly what you see in her photographs so much life happening on the street. Now here's a complex image, what the heck? It seems to be a broken mirror, maybe left out for the trash. Some children are picking up pieces of the mirror, uh, but some are holding it up like, like a gateway to another world. And here is this boy on a bike almost coming through. It kind of reminds me of like Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe. <laughs> Uh, but look around again and talking about edges in photographs, the completion of this edge, 
the inclusion of the strange woman walking in uh, some kind of white, white outfit um, and the completion of all the detail you need, uh, nothing you don't need. Now, if I were with you, I'm sure somebody's laughing, but I can't hear you. <laughs> so, so, children, curiosity. The pregnant girl, another girl carrying two bottles of milk. If anybody knows Cartier-Bresson's work, this image was actually made before Cartier-Bresson did the famous image of the young boy with the two wine bottles. Maybe he was influenced by this image of Helen Levitz. Maybe. There's such, such tenderness in Helen Levitt's vision. I hope you can feel it. You know, the, the intimacy, for example, of this uh, two women talking, the openness, kind of a tender gesture, respect, just gorgeous. And over and over in her work, the total engagement of children in whatever they're doing. Her books were assembled, uh, her images were assembled in a book called A, a Way of Seeing with um, an introductory essay by James Agee. And she says of her, of herself, she says, I can feel what people feel. <laughs> I love the humor. In the late 50s, uh, she did begin uh, photographing in color using slide film. And in, in that regard, she was a pioneer in this medium we kind of, because our phones and so on, we, we accept that color is always part of a photograph almost, but to, to really make a photograph work in color, it is another layer of composition, obviously. Um, the blues had to work. Uh, if, if it didn't work, his incredible shorts and this jaunty, uh, jaunty cane, um, the, the photograph wouldn't be nearly as powerful as it is, but the way the blues are echoing around this photograph, very masterful. How about this one with the wonderful warm tones plus the reflection um, coming in and the girl, and again, in this beautiful orange or ochre color. Um, not easy to do. Often I feel I look at color photographs in which people have forgotten they're even composing in color. It has to be, and Helen Levitt is really a good person to learn from, another level of awareness in your compositions. Look at the yellows in this and how they move across the uh, whole frame. Photography is another way of painting the world. So the yellows in here, the yellows coming through here, the splash of yellow and the splash of yellow. It's uh, in some ways just extraordinarily brilliant. Um, plus, then you get to enter into the gesture of this boy, um, what's going on, the signature Helen Levitt um, style of drama plus child, children engaged so fully in their own play. I have no idea what she's doing. I don't think she's peeing. She is in a puddle here looking under the car, but look at this abstract uh, <laughs> way her of her gesture um, again and the colors of the blue and the green car are working so well. These uh, color images were assembled in this book called Slideshow which was published in um, two, not till 2005 and Helen Levitt lived a long long life. This was published when she was 92. She died at age 96. I love these words of James Agee, and I'll end our time with Helen Levitt with what he had to say. At least a dozen of Helen Levitt's photographs seem to me as beautiful, perceptive, satisfying, and enduring as any lyrical work I know. The photographs as a whole combine into a unified view of the world 
an uninsistent but irrefutable manifesto of a way of seeing and in a gently and wholly unpretentious way, a major poetic work. Well, I hope you liked Helen Levitt. I adore her work. If, if I were a collector, I'd have at least about five of hers um, if I had had, had my dream. <laughs> okay, same with this guy coming up. You still out there, everybody? Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> see if you. <laughs> this is so hard. Okay, so now um, I can see the time. I'm probably going to go another ten minutes or so with me doing all the talking, as I introduce to you another extraordinarily lovely, wonderful human being and photographer, Roy de Carava. Now, of all the ones I've presented, I'm I'm hoping some of you have heard of him before. Many people have not. Um, and I uh, just have to say he's, uh, you know, one of my top five all-time favorite photographers. He was, um, he has a, an aesthetic. I'll just show you a few pictures and then give you some background. Photographing uh, in Harlem. Already, can you feel, I hope, we're entering into a different style actually not a dissimilar neighborhood, but a different style. There's a patience and a contemplation in this man's work. It's got space, it's got more quiet, it's got a certain kind of elegance. This is Roy de Carava. What does he see? How does he see the world? This is a lovely, lovely picture, I feel. You know, there's no other world except the pavement and this woman walking down the sidewalk, this beautiful line of her coat that the heel is lifting a few branches to let us know the season. It is, it opens up a whole world with her looking into that space. So about Roy de Carava, between about 1920 and 1940, there was a huge outburst of creativity that occurred in every aspect of art among Afri um, African Americans, and the cultural movement was known as the Harlem Renaissance. Writers, including Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, painters, Aaron Douglas, um, Lois Momboy, Malou Jones, Jacob Lawrence, Augusta Savage, musicians, Louis Armstrong, Billie Holiday, John Coltrane, Mahela, Ella, Dizzy Gillespie, among others, and among them Roy de Carava. He uh, was, I think I might have already said, was born of a um, Jamaican immigrant uh, raised by his mother. He, in high school, displayed extraordinary drawing talent and was encouraged by his teachers to go to Cooper Union in painting. But he left. There was a deep discrimination. He'd gotten in because no one knew he was Black in the entrance. They went by his portfolio. When they saw that he was African American, he experienced a great deal of uh, active discouragement, uh, and he left. And he had already developed an interest in photography um, and started working um, more seriously with his camera, initially as a portrait photographer. But he, he went to the Harlem School, Community Art School, and he began meeting people of the Harlem, you know, kind of Renaissance, the painters of the neighborhood. So immediately, let's just go back to what, what is Roy de Carava's style? Um, often, this one has it, uh, this uh, interiority, quiet, the sense of someone fully absorbed in his world, um, or a kind of spontaneity as this portrait of, uh, uh, and warmth as this portrait of Langston Hughes conveys. In the late 1940s, he began a series of portraits of the people of Harlem, attempting insight and understanding of Negroes, which I believe only a Negro photographer can interpret. He 
took the sense of quiet and respect for the everyday into his work as a photographer on, of the neighborhoods and streets of Harlem. He also has a kind of emblematic uh, aspect to his style, meaning this is a working man emerging out of the subway at the end of the day, but you can feel, I can feel, we can feel a kind of sense that he's all working men. He's put in a hard day's work. He has a, a kind of set jaw, his rumpled hat, um, and um, the clench of his hand on the belt. Also, as you'll notice, and the slides are, might be making this slightly difficult for you, but this is Roy de Carava's style, that there's often a lot of deep shadow area that you really have to look into. He photographed friends and neighbors. I love her expression, kind of dreamy. He had a sense of looking patiently and lovingly at the people he lived with. There's empathy and there's respect. Vicki Goldberg is a, a very well-known photo critic and done several books of, um, edited several books of photographs. Uh, she said this, his work is bathingly dark, suffused with stillness. De, De Carava reads the city's small secrets as it goes about its business unawares. And he comes in so close that everything outside his concentration falls away. I think that's beautifully said and so true. De Carava's work achieves a reflective state of grace in the way he looks at the world and in the way his pictures invite us to look at them. Don't you love that phrase, a reflective state of grace? How do we see that? In this one, for example, the quiet, the world this child is in, the moment found, the fact that just visually this child is arrived at visually by the way the railing and the stairs come as a line come down to where she is. She's looking through these bars or whatever. We can make whatever we want out of that. But the fact that she is both kind of wistful and self-contained, very beautiful, so beautiful. He, this is an image that's reproduced a great deal. Um, it's a tenement hallway. He's eliminated. In fact, it's odd. Uh, I'm going to say he doesn't have very many of his photographs that are purely architectural or purely abstract the way this one is. But he has spoken about it as a way to really show the constraints of the living situations that many of the friends he had um, ha had. This is a typical hallway, narrow, low lit, no windows. Um, and as I say, pretty abstract. But there's a gentleness, tenderness in his work, typically. It's not sentimental. And if I want to say something else, it's just that I, let's see, I'm going to go back to this one um, for a second, that, that the, the magazines and photography of the time had not seen photographs like this. I just have to try to convey to you how to say um, how well he brought humanity and respect to all the photographs he made in the African-American communities in, he, in which he lived. He said there were no images of black dignity, no images of beautiful black people. There was this big hole and I tried to fill it. Looking at the way people lived, coming home on a subway, 
And this one um, is one, again, we can talk more about if we have time. It's called Graduation 1949. So sweet and so layered. Is this not one of the most layered images you can see in terms of emblematic? Here she is on her way to her graduation in her white dress, in the sunlight, holding up the dress against the dirt of the street, entering into this next area, but with poise, courage. We can talk more about it. Beautiful photograph and one of his most famous. In 1950, de Carava had his first solo show. Steichen, again, uh, brought some of his images to, a, um, to MoMA. He won a Guggenheim. The award allowed him to keep working and he published a beautiful book called The Sweet Flypaper of Life with Langston Hughes. Some of his images, I'm sure many of you know, Family of Man exhibit that was so famous and the book is still available in 1955. Some of de Carava's images are in that. He had a long life as a professor uh, teaching at Cooper Union and then at Hunter College. These are the books that are uh, published of his lifetime. Um, this one particularly came from a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art that was about uh, 15 years ago, I'm gonna say. Oh yeah, okay, I'm gonna speed up, but you'll love these photographs. This is from his, <laughs> from his uh, another collection. He loved music. He tried to do something which is really hard. He tried to help photographs become almost visual equivalents to sound. This is Louis Armstrong jauntily walking down the street. But in this uh, collection called The Sound I Saw, he moved into the dance halls of Harlem. This is Billie Holiday singing in a living room. Here's John Coltrane. Do you feel the way the photographs are just trying, 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 it's a visual medium, but trying to get at the inner life of the musician, the intensity, the involvement, the place they go. The sound I saw, this is what he called this collection, a gospel singer, Mahalia Jackson. Those of you who are photographers out there, notice how he is employing the shallow depth of field and motion in the photographs to try to convey this layer of photography or the visual medium trying to approach um, the life of music. I'm gonna conclude with just these uh, two images from the civil rights movement of the 60s. He wanted to show the beauty of human promise to remove the circumstantial in order to reach the universal. We can imagine, I know you've seen lots of photographs of the 60s and if, I'm gonna flash before you just two of de Carava's and you'll see what his style is. Not everything, but the internal life of the people turning up to protest, the internal dignity the beauty of human promise, close in, asking us as, as viewers to engage with the inner life, the humanity, the, the worth of the people looking for America to be more of what it has promised. Beautiful, I mean, just so different. And there are many photographers who did fabulous images of these protests in the 60s. These two of Roy de Caravas are so distinctive of his vision and his style. It doesn't have to be pretty to be true, but if it's true, it's beautiful. Truth is beautiful. And so my whole work is about what amounts to a reverence for life itself. This is Roy as a distinguished professor later in his life. 
and lovely expression. I wish I had ever had a chance to meet him. He looks like a lovely person. So that's my talk. And I guess I'm gonna ask Mark to unmute you all and we can take questions first or just, it's been an hour. If you need to go, I totally get it. Um, if you'd like to stick around for the maybe 10, 15 minutes of questions, we can do that. And we can um, look at some slides. So Mark, is everybody unmuted? Um, people can now unmute themselves. There was a question from Betty asking if um, Robert Frank ever considered working in color. Ah. Totally a great question, or, Betty. Or was it too early? I, I mean, was, color didn't really come into fashion until a little bit later. You know, I'm not the photo historian who could say definitively he never worked in color. He might have. I've never seen anything in print. And um, you may know this, that after the Americans, he actually moved on to filmmaking on black and white. Um, experimental films, not Hollywood films. But as I had suggested, so fascinated was he by the importance of sequencing, the sequence of visual materials that um, that's his, um, you know, he was a very serious artist in, 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 in his entire life. And uh, he even made a movie about the Rolling Stones and some other kinds of things. But I, Betty, I can't think of one color image. So that's a good question, but I don't know that whether I'm right to say really he didn't. Well, his work is, is very powerful in black and white. I can imagine that he didn't. Yeah. That, yeah. For that reason that it was a choice. But um, as a photographer who works mostly in color, even though I try to do black and white, I, it's always fascinating to see the people that choose black and white first. Now, um, Heather Levitt, who I showed you, uh, did go, she oscillated. She went seriously into the black and white. That was mostly what I showed you. I showed you some of her color, but then she had, had times when she went back to black and white. So she was moving between the two. Well, thank you for showing her. She's my gal. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't know about her, so I will explore her more. Thank you. I believe I saw in Paris at an exhibit a, photo a photography exhibit uh, where Robert Frank was exhibited, I believe I saw very few, but I saw a few color photography. Yeah, I can't think of it. I anything. don't remember exactly what I could, if I looked it up, I could find, but, uh, and also at that time on the wall, they, well, what was expressed is that um, in some ways, black and white can express more than colors at times. And I'm a color, I've started with black and white photography, but I'm a color photographer mostly, but uh, especially portraits and people and, um, you know, even Cartier Brosseau did color, but they're better known for black and white, but as you know, you've done both. I'd like to know what do you prefer? Oh, well, I, I kind of like what you implied. Uh, you, uh, in the photographic medium, I think you choose what your subject needs. And um, yeah. so there's no like better, worse, the, you know, you, what you're trying, yeah. it, it's a vocabulary. And so it's, uh, you use what you need to use to express what you need to express. By the way, to Robert, there was an enormous show of Robert Frank at Tufts two years ago, three years ago, maybe. I mean, extraordinary. It was literally almost acres of stuff printed on endless rolls of paper throughout. And it was over, almost overwhelming. And I still come back to loving the Americans. The, almost the most. By the way, he was grumpy too. He, I, I was a student at the museum school and God, almost 50 years ago in the early 70s. And he was, he came to speak to us and he was pretty grumpy already then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't never thought much of his films later on too. Didn't he do Pull My Daisy and stuff like that? 
Yes. Yeah. And he did have a late life book called Lines of My Hand. And I, right. I, I agree with you, Derek, that the, you know, the Americans for, for me is, is it, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the whole body of his work. I know Americans, right. well, but it, it still keeps, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's the achievement, uh, really the best. Yeah, extraordinary. Okay. And a, a, a comment, hi Parish. that was really wonderful. One of the things, and, and you brought it up, but as I was viewing this, I was thinking kind of the change of, um, I grew up taking, uh, you know, black and white photography and going out and shooting, you know, uh, you know, images of people and you didn't really think about it or people didn't, weren't, weren't worried about it. And, and then what, the photography that I do now or working when I was working for a state senator and taking public pictures, there became this whole question of, you know, intrusiveness and you're taking pictures of children and people are worried about this and you can't Absolutely. just go to a park and do you have permission? Listen, we have this in, in our church, you, if you, you know, do we post these things? And so it's almost, a, I've become stunted and worried about, you know, I had to be very careful about I'm taking a, hi, I'm a photographer. I'm not stalking you. Do you mind if I post a picture about you? And how so, you know, whereas people want to be in control of their own images now and everyone's out there doing this stuff. But when you want to go out and do street photography or other things, there's, there's this kind of, you know, oh my God, there's a person in a park with a camera. What does that mean? And it seems like it's, is it stunted the art form or I'm just wondering how we respond to this change in not only the technology uh, and the spontaneousness, but uh, of what that means to um, publish images of other people. Well, yeah. you can actually use legally. It is my belief that if people are in a group in a park or somewhere, uh, from far away, you can take uh, pictures with the long lens, you can zoom in, or you can take the picture and then increase the size. I mean, we, we have software that allows us to own on just one piece. Yeah, but it's just the sense I feel more intrusive about doing that right. now, oh, absolutely. In, in a way. Yeah, no, I understand that, um, Jean, and it, it, it it's a delicate, it's a delicate issue for people who want to do kind of found street photography and um, legally it, it doesn't have to do with the long lens or anything. It's just apparently, I'm not the lawyer of this, but I, I, had, to, I had to communicate this to students enough to say that when you walk in a public space, you do, in a sense, you have, it's not that you've given up your integrity or your, your, your privacy, but um, you are part of the public common. And so if somebody takes your picture, uh, they can. Um, a Boston Globe photographer who then wants to publish that photograph has an obligation to get a permission and right. to get a model release. But <clears throat> not for publication is, um, you know, somebody can certainly say to you, I don't want you to photograph me. And, and, and my view would, of course, I'm sorry, and, and leave. But um, permissions for publication, yes, but just to be photographed is, is legal, legally part of it. And what's publication if you post something on your Facebook page or your Instagram and, you know, as a, yeah. you know, yeah, it's. I don't have that. Well, those of you who are still hanging out, did you find some kind of connections between these three people and our current climate and time yeah well painfully so i think of course but uh, also i just want to thank you because i'm newly inspired again i mean you know, i've you know i've i used to be a photographer and now i've turned into a sculptor and that doesn't lend itself very well to the virtual world so i have to admit early this spring i bought a film scanner a good one to, to work on old black and white negatives going back to the late 60s and i have to admit i've not yet plugged in the machine so now I may do that. So thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? And I don't know whether we're, we're, you would like to see a slide for discussion. Yeah, yeah, Parrish, I, a couple things. I mean, I, I guess overall, I love Jean's um, comments. Um, I think I'm just struck with the self-consciousness we all have from 
being photographed, from seeing images of ourselves and what a different time this was, first right. of all. And then when we were looking at Robert Frank, um, I kept thinking of Hopper. There was the image of the gal in the elevator with the elegant people going by her. And I thought about his, his theater um, usher and he tended to pick people out that were in a dreamy, dreamy reverie. Um, not so much maybe a social commentary as Robert Frank, but I wondered if there were mutual influences between him and Frank and between any of these photographers and um, painters. Wow, good question, great question. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, all three of these people were very immersed in the art world. I mean, I didn't say this, for example, about Helen Levitt, but she was a avid theater goer, avid, attended dance concerts, uh, mm -hmm. went to museums a lot. Frank, um, interesting, almost all of them had started as painters and then migrated to, to photography. Um, Janet, I, I am imagining there was a lot of cross-pollination between painting of the time, but I'm not a scholar on that, so. Well, late in his life, or maybe by referential to Cartier-Bresson and Helen Levitt, that Cartier-Bresson late in his life said, I don't like photography, I never have. I always wanted to be a painter. Right, yeah, exactly, yeah. Which was crushing to those of us who idolized him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so. Um, so anyway, so my host, or, or um, Doris, are you still there? I'm just wondering whether we should wrap up or do you want to have a discussion of an individual image, ever, anybody? I'm all game. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, have a, I have one more question if okay. no one else does. Um, and Mark, I, I know this because you're head of our nugget that you are also a photographer who does underwater photography. And I, I just kind of wonder with what sensibility you've been watching all of this. Um, I, I don't know that I can formulate a question out of that, but I, I, I think all of our experiences watching this and I'm hearing that there are a number of you that are photographers are different. And I wonder what yours is. Um, so nature photographer is so different than shooting people. Um, it's almost an entirely different medium. Hmm. Um, I mean, I find this very interesting and I struggle when people ask me to photograph things involving people because it's so different than how I approach shooting wildlife. I mean, the whole thing earlier, the question of color versus black and white in nature photography, I always shoot color and will very occasionally after shooting convert something to black and white if the colors don't work well but otherwise color is always preferred in nature photography. Whereas with people, sometimes you want to distill down to just part of it. And it really does work better in black and white. Right. Uh, I wondered if anyone saw, there was a great special the other night um, about uh, Pete Souza. Yes, oh. oh. <laughs> it was bad. bad. <laughs> Oh, and by the, by the way, that shot of the woman and the, the elevator operator, uh, during the Democratic Convention, of course, they talked about, there was a speaker was the elevator operator at the New York Times building when, who talked about how Biden actually noticed her. Yeah. And, you know, and so, so I thought, when I saw that elevator operator, I thought of yeah. Biden and, his, and the elevator operator. But, uh, in, I'm, in, I'm, in response to your question, I saw it originally um, on Friday night when it was, when it was broadcast, but I, I was like just three or four seconds late to the very, very beginning. And that justified, I watched it all entirely all over again on Saturday. I, I watched it two times in a row. I mean, if it were on tonight, I would watch it instead of the yeah, debate. I highly recommend folks that, and, and the thing was the complete juxtaposition of here is Pete Souza who has given complete access, you know, to, the White House, everywhere they go, 
And we have now, and, and, and the, the history that is just in those pictures and the intimacy of what it you know, is and the, the scenes of, you know, what's it like, you know, in uh, you know, control rooms or interacting with, with, with children. And, and we have a president who has no photographer that is capturing what the moments are, everything is cast like an apprentice program, that there is no images of, of, of genuine, you know, of genuineness of what is occurring inside the White House. Um, so um, it, it's, anyway, I highly recommend it to folks. Yeah, I gotta watch it again. <laughs> Everybody knows it's called the way I saw it, right? Um, the way I see it. Oh, the way I see it. Okay, good. And he, it's a documentary about Pete Souza, but you get to see a huge amount of his pictures of Obama uh, in the eight years. Any other? And, and Reagan. He he he, he, he was also a photographer for Reagan. So it's you know it's not so much that it's partisan at all. Yeah, that's true. But he did spend eight years with the Obamas. So. But all photographies that are taken in, in so-called political places, it doesn't really matter what politics, they're staged most of the time. I know because I participated, when I was a child, it was in Europe, but I'm sure it's the same here. I remember participating in some of those uh, supposedly natural occurrences being photographed and being there and how things were done and this. So uh, indeed we don't have any now inside the White House, but it would be a little bit unbelievable to believe that in the US it was different from what was done in Europe at the Elysee, for example. You'd see the president at work or chatting with somebody supposedly uh, freely, and uh, but it was all staged. Harish, I want to thank you so much. That was really interesting and inspiring, and so so connected in a gentle way to what is going on now. And I, I wish we could see more pictures like that. Now we just don't. We see the harsh stuff. No, and the critical stuff. That. And I just want to mention that, interestingly, next month on November 12th, we're going to have a program by Nancy Baker, who is um, a volunteer at the Manchester, New Hampshire Museum, and has spoken to us before. And she is speaking about the art of the Harlem Re Renaissance. Perfect. Great. So it's going to be all connected and, and all connected to what's, what we're seeing now. But this was just an outstanding parish. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, parish. But also your own photographs are very beautiful. I've had the pleasure of seeing them. And Jean's portraits, your husband's beautiful book of portraits. Mm, yes. I'd so like to mention this yeah, here. Maybe he could come for another. Yeah. It, it, he has a book called Heroic Women in the Art World. And Doris, you were about to say something. Doris. Oh, you're muted, Doris. Unmute. 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 Am I yeah. muted? Yeah, yeah. now you, we hear you. We hear you now. Okay. No, I was just going to ask Pat to say what the previews of coming attractions are, and she uh -huh. just did that. So that was wonderful. Did you hear me? Yeah. Yes. And yes. Uh, I just think we're so indebted to you, Parrish. I've always known that was the case. This is not a surprise at all, but I just wish you so much luck and so much good aesthetic eye continuing to look forward to wonderful new uh, attempts that you're going to make with your art. You, you're, you're a rare bird, kiddo. And, uh, <laughs> I, was, this, and, and we see, I, was, I was right. I'd follow her anywhere. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Love you. And thanks. And, and Thank another, you, Mark. Another lifetime beyond pandemic. I just wish you could all come to open studios. You know, if we're there by this yes. spring. Yeah. Oh, must. I hope we can all get back there. But this is, yes. this is wonderful in the interim. And I'm thank the Alliance. Okay. Uh, I think we should all. finish, Mark. Um, yeah. Thank you. But, yeah. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you all. Well, you.